Well, welcome everybody. Um, some of you I've seen um, earlier in the week and uh, some of you look new. Um, so we're going to do a very sort of Tibetan Buddhist thing of um, starting with the refuge in bodhicitta prayer. So if some of you aren't Buddhist or aren't in the mood for this sort of thing, um, go to your happy place in your mind. <laughs> no, just take a minute um, while we do this prayer, if you don't feel comfortable saying it, to just really connect with a bigger motivation than yourself and a bigger motivation than just today. You know, just sort of connect with some altruistic thought while we do this prayer. Um, and then we'll do um, the four immeasurable thoughts, which is just on the next page. <clears throat> So, refuge in bodhicitta. Sange Jodan Zogi Jonam Lai Janchu Badu Dani Gabsuji Dagi Jin Zogi Be Zonam Drolha Penchi Sange Drupa Sho Sange Jodan Zogi Jonam La Janchu Badu Dani Gabsuji Dagi Jin Zogi Be Zonam Gi Drolha Penchi Sange Drupa Sho Sange Jodan Zogi Jonam Janchu Padu Dani Gapsuchi Dagi Jin Zogi Be Sonam Drolha Penchi Sange Drupa Sho And the four immeasurable thoughts May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes May all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings never be separated from joy without suffering. May all sentient beings in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger. And so just sitting with those four. And think that during this evening talk and whatever part of the retreat you're able to attend and whatever you do in the rest of your life, may there be some influence of compassion, love, joy, and equanimity. Thinking that just like myself, every single living being just wants to be happy, wants to be free from suffering, just like me, sometimes they are correct and sometimes they are incorrect or mistaken about the strategies to achieve that happiness and freedom from suffering. May whatever I learn here tonight not just stay with me, but have a ripple effect of benefit. Okay, so that, um, that practice of setting our motivation um, is very traditionally Buddhist, but even if you're not uh, at all religious in any way, it is a good idea to, before you do anything, to ask yourself why. And when you ask yourself, why am I doing this, to check, is it from a place of big picture, greater good, or is it very narrow and self-centered? Because part of the things that we're going to be touching on during the retreat are that when you think of the greater good in the big picture, you as an individual benefit. You as one person actually winds up being quite happy. When you think only about yourself and only about a narrow focus in a small picture, you wind up suffering more. So if at any point during the day it occurs to you to remember to ask, why am I doing this? Even as simple as like going to the supermarket to buy groceries, why am I doing this? And you say, that's a stupid question, I need food, right? But then you take that and say, just like me, all sentient beings need food, need sustenance. Just like me, all of these people in the supermarket are just trying to get through the day, get what they need. If I'm not seeing them as human beings, they immediately become obstacles. They feel like they're in my way. 
if I'm thinking of them as fellow living beings, there's a friendliness that genuinely comes within me. And with that friendliness is a relaxation. They stop seeming like problems. And now it's just you with your fellow man. So it's, it's a really powerful thing to do before you do any activity to ask yourself why and then consciously broaden the focus. So, um, quickest way to stop being burnt out. So, I think um, uh, you, you, this is a really interesting topic to do in a Western country because uh, we are particularly prone to burnout. Do you think? Yes. I'm sure people in the East burn out just as much, especially in China, poor darlings, right? But in the West, we're almost encouraged to burn out. <laughs> Do you think? Mm -hmm. Like almost you're not allowed to rest until you're unwell from working so hard. Mm -hmm. Then you have permission to rest. Do you think sometimes this is in the culture? It's certainly in American culture. Maybe you guys are a little more healthy than us. I have the impression that you are more healthy with your vacation leave and the support of your government and the support of your workplaces. And yet, uh, so far I hear burnout happens here too. True? Yeah, <laughs> yeah? okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's really interesting to explore what does this to us. What exactly is it? What are the components? Um, and so before we even start going into Buddhist ideas and seeing whether you agree or not, um, I'm gonna just lead you through a short reflection. Not even a meditation, just a short reflection. And um, having your eyes closed might help you be less distracted, but you can keep your eyes open if you want to. But what I'm gonna do is just ask you a few questions and you just answer them silently in your head just to kind of get the juices flowing for this topic. So start by asking yourself, what makes me tired? What makes me personally tired in my life right now? And is it that physical exertion makes me tired and my mind tired? Or is it that mental exertion makes me tired and then my body becomes <coughs> tired as well? Just for yourself as an individual, is it more often your body first is tired or your mind first is tired and then the other one becomes tired as well? Which comes first for you? body or mind. And so probably sometimes the body makes you tired first, but more likely is your mind gets stressed, which leads to a heaviness in the body. It can go either direction, but let's just explore when the mind was the catalyst for the fatigued feeling. Are there times you are tired because you've spent the whole day doing something that you didn't want to do? You had to do it, you made the choice to do it, but all day in the back of your mind was, I wish this was not my life right now. Does that ever make you tired? Not really wanting to do what it is you're doing. like part of your mind is trying to escape all day because you'd rather not be doing what you're doing. Do 
do you think that sometimes you're tired because you spend a whole day doing something maybe you like to do, but you're looking for someone to notice or praise or give you feedback? So there's the work, which maybe is okay, but is there also part of your mind looking for approval, signs of approval? Is this ever an element in your own fatigue? And are you ever tired because you overestimated what was actually possible? That you based your plan for the day on the best version of yourself when you're the most healthy, the most well-rested, the most relaxed and content. And you made a long-term plan based on an assumption that you would stably be that energetic when in fact that type of stability wasn't possible. Does overestimation ever make you tired? and just relax your attention. Okay. So I'm um, curious, you know, if any of that resonated or if any of that triggered an argument in your head. If anyone was thinking, sure, 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 but really it's my boss. <laughs> sure, 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 but really it's the pressures of society. Um, or, if, or if you were thinking, oh yes, I do do that, I'm so bad, and went into like a spiral of depression and self-loathing, might have happened, right? Um, or you might have been like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just curious, what, what happened when, when those uh, questions were put to you? What did you think about? What makes you tired? The mind. The mind, the mind. <laughs> True. <laughs> Listening to an American accent, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but just spending time on things that are not really important to you. Yeah, yeah. Doing, yeah. In all the sense, when I'm doing it, like it's not, it's not hard, felt, and important. Yep. It's something that I do basically, uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, doing things that aren't important to you. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone have that one where you have to do it, but doing things that aren't important to you make you tired? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge one. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah. What else? That's huge. What else? Yeah. Uh, when I Yep, your self-imposed expectations. Yep, it's a classic. And it would seem reasonable, except for, as, as I mentioned, you know, we have kind of an unrealistic idea of ourselves that seems realistic because we are that efficient, that energetic sometimes. And we hold that up as, this, as like the gold standard of who we are rather than seeing that as an occasional way we are. And then there's something slightly less efficient, slightly less energetic that we are more of the time. But we make our plans best, based on the best version of ourself, even though that guy comes and goes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we feel terrible because you know what's possible for you. 
right? You know what you could do on a really good day, and then you don't, and you feel terrible, like you've let people down, you've let yourself down, your pride gets triggered, who am I if I can't do this? When in fact you've made a plan based on a more occasional version of yourself than the one that's more there. And the one that's more there was perfectly fine. Yeah, you were just demanding too much of them. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really common one. The expectations we put on ourselves are not realistic expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I think in that case, it's connected to society also because um, there are a few uh, jobs that you can't do and just go home and not feel like it. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of jobs that have an assumption you will take it home with you, don't they? Or, um, or you work eight hours a day. Yeah, absolutely. And society puts this pressure on, you know, who is society? We are society. <laughs> yeah, we are society. But it's, it's strange. It becomes this feedback loop because we want to perform to the expectation, even though no one is meeting that expectation consistently. But some people are meeting it occasionally which makes us think it must be possible and that we must be failures because we are not as consistently achieving that. Forgetting that when we see people really, really succeeding at, with working crazy hours and not having any personal time and not having any space to contemplate or for their families or for their hobbies, that we're seeing just a short window of their life. You know, we're not seeing um, the vacation before that or the burnout after. We're seeing this small window and think, why can't I do that? Do you think? Yeah. And, and, but then the problem is, is that we develop coping mechanisms to kind of get us almost there, close enough to get by. You know, too much caffeine, uh, too much prescription drugs, too much whatever to kind of like push you to keep going, keep going. Um, deciding that not enough sleep is an okay way to be always. Um, that that just underlying too tired feeling can just be the way I am now. Yeah? And you decide that that's acceptable because what else can you do? Yeah? Or if you are not really, really busy, and if you are not slightly tired, you must not care about the world. <laughs> or you must be lazy, right? If you don't look tired, you must not care. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. There's like a um, glorification of being busy, mm -hmm. as if it were like <laughs> a moral status, right? <coughs> yeah? Um, I, there's even uh, my grandmother, my Swedish grandmother, I'll have you know. <laughs> if I say, oh, how are you, Grandma? She'll say, oh, keeping busy. Keeping busy. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, so is that good or bad? <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. As if that's a virtue in and of itself. And, um, you know, it's important to point out that um, thieves are very busy. <laughs> right? Ants are very busy. Right? Little ants. They're super busy. And probably more efficient and productive. Right? It's like busyness is not a virtue in and of itself, right? But it is held up to be. And it takes great strength of will to say, today I'm not doing anything. Society, right? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> They're like, oh, so you're working in the house? Yeah, you're working from home? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, nah. You're like, oh, so you're doing the laundry, some home maintenance, weeding the garden? Nah. I'm just going to read Harry Potter and pet the cat. That's it. That's all I've got today. <laughs> Maybe a cup of tea. That's it. Jammies. Pajamas all day. Right? I mean, you know, and you feel like you're being rebellious, right? Right? You could party all night and not feel as rebellious as just taking a day off and not doing anything. You know? It's almost more rebellious to do that than go to a rave, take ecstasy, go to work the next morning. Right? That's kind of less rebellious than just hanging out in your pajamas all day. Right? It's, it's very interesting to unpack this because just because this is what everyone does doesn't mean it's useful or right or that we should try and copy it. But if we don't copy it, people will be a little confronted, won't they? And they'll think maybe something about us. What if people judge us? 
they already are, <laughs> right? They already are. So, you know, why does well be happy? Yeah. They're either judging you kindly or harshly anyway. Might as well be happy in the meantime. Yeah. Do we have total control over what people think of us? We don't, right? Um, but if we are taking our confidence from other people's ability to see how productive we are, we will just become little machines. But we are not as efficient as machines. Yeah. So uh, this whole practice is really talking very much about not stopping totally, not, uh, not completely getting a new job, getting a new spouse, getting a new hobby. It's not about getting a new anything external per se, though that might happen as the result of these thoughts. But you could live exactly the same life as you have been living, but be happier and less tired with just some gentle tweaks in how you approach your inner energy and your outer output, and some gentle tweaks about your attitude. And it's very different than um, our normal strategies, which are escape strategies, which are symptoms relief strategies, which do work for a moment and should never be, you know, we should never shame people for using those techniques like having some burnout rest time, like going on a holiday, right? Those are perfectly valid things to do. Just resting is perfectly valid, but it doesn't change the tendency to burn out again. It doesn't prevent you from burning out again. You might have a fear of burnout, then when you go back into whatever it is that you were doing that burnt you out, and might think, I should pace myself differently. But we still don't really understand how we got ourselves that fried, except for to look at our schedule. Yeah, we go, oh, it must have been a scheduling issue. That's what it was. When in fact it was a what is my motivation and purpose question. Yeah. Because the physical output itself is not necessarily the thing that makes you tired. It's the mind you bring to it. Which is why we ask the question, are you tired when you do what you don't want to do? Why are you tired when you do what you want to, don't want to do? That's a good question. Why do you think that makes you tired? Say it's like a really easy job, some like admin, like data entry job. Right? It's like not intellectually difficult, but you really don't feel like doing it. And at the end of the day, you're just wiped out. Why? Yeah. Um, maybe it's because before you even start doing it, you have to meet your resistance yep. and fight against it. Exactly. So you have like an entire battle before you even start. Absolutely. Exactly that. Yep. It's your resistance. You're having a whole battle with your resistance, trying to work yourself up into the right frame of mind to do this thing you don't want to do. And so you're almost tired before you start. Um, is there a way to decide to like what you're doing? Have you ever done it? Like, for example, if you have a holiday planned and you're saving up for it. If you have a holiday planned and you're saving up your money for it, sometimes going to work is a little less painful because of what it leads to. Yeah? And you might even put in more hours and work even harder to get overtime and more whatever so that you can go on this holiday. And sometimes if you're excited enough about this holiday, work itself is more fun because the end is in sight. Same job. Do you understand? And so it's really looking at tweaking what is our goal here in life? What is our goal here in life? What is the point of our existence? These are the questions that when you kind of get tasting some answers, then it feeds back into your daily life and creates a framework where you pace yourself in a useful way and that anything can take on meaning because of the big picture. It's, it's just interesting to experiment with. So even just the slightly bigger picture of this isn't just my life, it's my life that's going to soon have a vacation in it, just a slightly bigger picture already makes this little job less of a pain. Yeah? What if you had the most giant worldview possible? What if you had the greatest motivation possible? What if you aim for something that seems almost impossible? What if you saw, thought, the purpose of my life is perfection? 
oh no, that's a terrible idea, right? That's what got us into trouble in the first place, trying to be perfect. No, right? But we're not talking about worldly perfect. We're talking about having completely gotten rid of your negative states of mind, like attachment and anger and jealousy and pride and all of these things that are really causing you internal agitation and make you hurt other people. And it means completely developing your positive states of mind, like love and compassion and patience and all of these things that we all value when they're happening within us and other people value when we're radiating them out. So what if the purpose of your life was to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings? Then you can do your crappy admin job and it'd be fine. Why? It goes within this different framework. The framework isn't just getting through the day. The framework isn't just getting enough to meet my needs. It's not just, here's a holding pattern until I figure out something else to do. It's, these are the activities that happen to be in my life, but they're not the point of my life. The point of my life is being hungry for transformation, being hungry for meaning, being hungry for connection and benefit. Then you start looking at your job differently and you notice who are the people that I interact with within this job, whether online or in the office place. What is, um, what is the way I'm bringing a healthier climate to my workplace by my kindness and consideration of others? What can I do to make this job more interesting for anyone who has to have it after me? Or more fun or more efficient? Um, you know, just tiny little things that even if they don't work, that doesn't matter because that is not the point of your life anymore. The point of your life is this big thing. And so this little thing just happens to be the formula that you're doing it within. It means that also you can do something like a holiday and it have meaning. Sometimes when we go on holiday, we have such pressure and expectations about what it should do for us that we almost get tired on holiday. You come back from holiday and have to like recover from your holiday. Has this ever happened, right? It seems like it should be restful, but you put a lot of pressure on this holiday to make you feel better. Yeah, you really thought about it a lot. You were really hanging out for it. And at the end of that holiday, there's sometimes a bit of a letdown. Yeah, but if you're thinking the purpose of my life is to transform my mind and be of benefit, is to understand the nature of reality and how to bring kindness into it, then holiday is a totally different thing. Yeah, there can be inconveniences, there can be, you know, um, missed bookings, there can be added expenses, you can lose your luggage, and it's all part of the fuel for your practice. And it, life is more interesting and rich that way. So having a giant motivation gives you more energy. And I think, you know, it's, you use a really boring sort of everyday example to remind yourself that this is true, okay? So imagine that you live with people in a house. Perhaps you do live with people in a house, probably an apartment, right? But anyway, you live with people, yes? Uh, or a cat or a dog or have lived with people at some point in your life, yes? Everyone has lived with people at some point in their life. Okay, so the people you live with, um, you all are in this shared space, and in the shared space there's a couple problems, like there's a link, leaky faucet in the bathroom, and there's a, a door that always squeaks, and there's like just like a mold situation in the laundry that just really needs some attention. Yeah, there's like a mold situation, okay. So there's a few like household things that have been sort of like on everyone's mind for a while, but no one's had the time or the energy to do anything about it. So say the people you live with all leave for some reason, they're gonna be gone for two weeks, and you think, I'm gonna get these projects done while they're away. Yeah, they're gonna be so happy when they come home because finally, there's not gonna be the mold situation and the door situation and the faucet situation. They're gonna be so happy. We've all been just so annoyed by this for months. Yeah, and so you set out to do these projects and you get them done with this kind of joyful mind even though the tasks themselves are not very exciting, right? 
you know this feeling of when you're doing something for others and for the greater good, you can even have a, quite a joy with it. And then they come home and they're like, oh, finally, oh my gosh, that looks so much better. And they're so happy, right? And you're happy. But the thing is, is that you also wound up with a better house. You also wound up with those projects fixed. Now, if you didn't live with these people or weren't thinking about them, if you were just thinking about these three projects for your own sake, you would have this kind of like, oh, feeling. Like, all right, I'm just going to do it. Oh, right? All right, I'm going to do it. And then you just sort of drag yourself from task to task. And afterwards, you're like, well, oh, glad that's done. Yeah? But it, it was somehow more effort to do it just for you. It was somehow less effort to do it for the household. But they were the same tasks. Do you sort of understand my example? Right? So this is what we're thinking about with the great purpose of enlightenment is if you have this idea that I want to become a Buddha, <laughs> this is crazy, right? I want to become awakened, this is crazy. But what if it's just you believe in a totally secular way about just one life that some sort of internal change is possible, okay? Never mind future lives, never mind Buddhahood, just an idea that some progress within this life is possible. And you're really thinking, okay, I want transformation and self-improvement. Some days it's worth your time, some days it's not. But if you're thinking for the benefit of all of the people I come into contact with, then it's worth your time always. Yeah? If it's just for you, you're like, today not so much caring about transformation. <laughs> right? Today I don't really want to look at the big picture. Yeah? But if you think others actually would benefit a lot more and have a lot more happiness in their life if I brought something brighter to it. Yeah? Um, you know, your friends and your family would probably prefer you in a good mood than a bad mood. Do you think? Yeah? If you interviewed them, they'd be like, so when I'm in a bad mood, that's fun for you, right? <laughs> they'd be like, no. <laughs> what if you were just in your best mood more often? Just that. You were just in that more, you know, cruisy, happy, funny, generous version of yourself more often. That would be nice for your family, yes? It would be nice for your coworkers. Yeah? Just just that. And then what, what happens as a byproduct is you're happier more often too. You know, so you're starting from I want to benefit them, therefore I'm working on myself. But in thinking I want to benefit them, you are more content. Your life has more purpose. But you have to do this in a skillful way that doesn't feel like you're trying to fix anyone or need validation or praise for it. That the process itself is enriching enough that no one has to really notice. They'll be benefited whether they notice or not. And what's more, they might not even really notice in a um, really obvious way because, you know, we pick out the bad things to focus on. Yeah, so they notice when you're in a bad mood. I'm sure they notice. Yeah, but do they notice when you're in a good space more and more often? They won't even notice that their quality of life is slightly better because you're less obnoxious. <laughs> but it will have a benefit. Yeah. So again, you're taking this big picture view as a way of opening up the potential for more energy in your life. Does it make some sense? Are you lost anybody? Yeah. So what we have going on with the context of this teaching is called the six paramitas or the six perfections, which are like the motivations and activities and uh, goals of a bodhisattva. So a bodhisattva is someone who has realized bodhicitta perceptually. And so an uncontrived bodhicitta is this wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings present in every moment. So for us, it would come and go. It's something we have to conjure up. It's a thought we have to stop and think about working to benefit others, right? Sometimes it's with us and sometimes we forget. Now, the thing is about the mind is that it will do whatever you train it to do. So if you repeat a thought again and again, it becomes your like natural way of thinking. Yeah? And we have tons of evidence of this already in our life. When you repeat a thought again and again, it becomes how you think. 
whether it's true or not, <laughs> right? But if you're going over and over again, the purpose of my life is, the purpose of my life is, the purpose of my life is, very clear with consistent logic, consistent experience backing it up, it becomes your natural like default mode, yeah? And so a bodhisattva is someone who's just imbuing everything they do is the wish to be of benefit to others. And the way that looks is these six paramitas, or these six perfections. So the first three, generosity, ethics, and patience, are pretty much just as you would assume them to be, just from the word in English, except for a slight nuance, which is that generosity is not actually the act of giving, it's the intention to give. So these are mental states that then manifest as verbal and physical actions, but they are mental states. So to have perfect generosity, you could have no possessions and it'd be no problem. Yeah, because it's this intention to give, which really changes how you are as a person. Yeah, if you're just like ready, you have a readiness to offer whatever it is you have, whether it's time, whether it's love, whether it's freedom from fear, or something material, you know, like some soup or a cup of coffee or some charitable thing. If you're just like in the mood to give, you know, it's just your kind of default mood, people feel so relaxed with you, right? They don't feel nervous to take up space near you. They feel happy to come into your house and not like they're invading and they're going to break something. You know, and you have friends like this, right? Who it's just so easy to be with them because they've worked on their intention to give. And so a bodhisattva has this as one of their just go-to ways of being. Um, ethics is like restraint from harm. So morality from a Buddhist perspective, it's not like rules of do's and don'ts to be a good kid, right? It's about not harming yourself or others. It's very practical. It's not about punishment or reward, not at all. People sometimes misunderstand karma, thinking that it's punishment and reward. No, it's cause and effect, just natural cause and effect, like gravity, things drop. No one is saying you must or you're bad not to. It's just natural cause and effect. So ethics is being very aware of cause and effect and deciding to not harm. And this sounds so simple, doesn't it? It sounds like, well, I'm a nice person. I don't want to hurt anyone. But actually, we forget how often a slight ill will creeps in to our voice, into our actions. There's just little threads, and we barely catch them because they're subtle, but just like little tendrils of passive aggressiveness. Yeah, just like little bits and pieces of us kind of wanting to bring people down. It happens. So if you consciously preempt that, it's a powerful state of mind. Yeah. Sometimes I find such an ethic such a complex subject because maybe you have an intention to do good, but it actually causes harm. Yeah. And it becomes this purest, nicest intention, but the end result is that you don't benefit the person at all. Yeah. Um, and in that case, I don't know if it's ignorance or what it comes from, like how to navigate it. Yeah, and it's a huge point because even if we want to help, we're not guaranteed to be helpful. <laughs> and we won't know what is helpful 100% unless we have clairvoyance, uh -huh. right? Um, we have an educated guess. We have a guess that's educated by our life experience and our logic, but it's going to be a more educated guess if we are calm. Yeah, because when the mind is agitated, when the mind is stirred up, your options become fewer and more animal. Yeah, more, you know, knee jerk, fight, flight, freeze. These sort of things are more your immediate reaction. When your mind is still and when your mind is calm, then your life wisdom is accessible, right? This, you, you don't lose the lessons that you've learned. I mean, how many times have we done something but knew better? Right? We made a mistake, but it was actually even a lesson we learned before, and we think, gosh, at least could I make new mistakes? Yeah, and, but you made the same old mistake you'd made a million times before. It's not because we planned on it, it's because we were distracted, right? So a distracted mind is dangerous because it means you go more into animal mode. 
Yeah, it means you go much more into self-centeredness. So having a calm mind is something that we really want to work on because a calm mind is less reactive, but also a calm mind you can add positive states to and they take root. Yeah. So, so ethics is, is interesting and, you know, mostly we talk about refraining from the ten non-virtuous actions, the things that really harm ourselves and others, but there's also the ethics of doing the positive things and being of benefit to others. So, you know, ethics is a beautiful topic to go into, um, but anyway, just know that it exists. <laughs> Stay tuned for other courses. Um, the next one is patience, which is forbearance with suffering. So being, being patient when things don't go your way, physically or mentally or in your surrounds, which is not like gritting your teeth and being like, oh, I'll just get through it. It's not that. It's not that at all. It's framing your situation differently. So for example, when someone is really, really... Um, harmful to you in some way, like they speak very badly about you or they're undermining you in some way or maybe they betray you, you know, maybe your partner cheats on you or your boss is mean to you or whatever, you know, somebody mugged you, stole your car, whatever. You take the, the natural reaction, quote natural, because it's habitual, would be to be angry, right? And no one would blame you. <laughs> yeah, someone hurts you, you're angry. No one blames you for that. But is it solving the issue? Is it making you feel better? Yes, you know this saying that uh, harboring anger is like swallowing poison and expecting the other person to die, right? You know this saying, <laughs> right? And it really is like that. We somehow feel like we need to be angry, otherwise people won't know they did wrong, right? What if we're patient, then they won't, they won't know they were bad. <laughs> I'll show them, even if it's just someone cutting you off in traffic who will never see you again. You have to be angry about it. It's the rule. Otherwise, they won't know they were a bad driver. They don't know they're a bad driver. That's why they just did that. <laughs> and they're gone now. <laughs> they're not seeing your face. But it's like we have this weird logic, don't we, about our anger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, isn't if there is a spontaneous anger, is that not, not a kind of uh, natural reaction of something when I have been hurt or in a situation like you described? Yeah, yeah, natural but not necessary. Yeah, natural, of course. Stress, so not yeah, of course, natural. Yeah, everybody, but not <laughs> necessary. Meaning you can train yourself out of it being natural and something else can become natural. Because what we call natural is just habituated. Yeah? And we forget that at one point <coughs> it either occurred to us or it was taught to us that a certain behavior is unacceptable. And that unacceptable behavior means I have a right to retaliate. Even if my retaliation is just to show them my ugly face instead of my friendly face or to withhold kindness and affection rather than give them kindness and affection, right? So, you know, I, I really like to compare my own, my own crazy mind in different kinds of public transportation, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I'm in Australia, I have an expectation that the train will be on time and it will be clean and there won't be too many people in it because often that has been the case, right? So if it's noisy and smelly and late, it's normal to get angry about that, forgetting that that was my, my expectation set me up for anger. If I'm in India, I don't expect the train to be on time. I don't expect it to smell good. I don't expect it to be quiet. I have none of these expectations because history has shown me if I do, I'll be wrong, right? So when I go to India and it's smelly and late and whatever, I'm sort of fine, right? I'm not upset by that because I already assumed that would be the case. Yeah? So the problem is, is that our mind says it was the lateness, it was the smell, it was the noise that made me feel this way. That's what made me feel this way. It's their fault. Those things. If those things were why I felt bad, then they would make me feel bad in any context. But they only make me feel bad in one specific context because of how I set myself up to feel. Yeah? And, and we are so different in our reactions moment to moment, but don't even realize it. 
For example, like if it's pouring down with rain and it's really gloomy and gray, if you're in a kind of artistic mood, you might feel like it's kind of cozy and get kind of creative and write something. Yeah, if you're really depressed, that rain will seem to be making you more depressed. If you are newly in love, it will feel life-affirming and full of vitality, right? It's always just the rain, right? But we're attributing this significance above and beyond what is actually there. And sometimes it's fun and doesn't cause us trouble, but often the expectation really gives us a lot of grief. Do you know what I mean? Right? So patience is so tricky because you realize you're in charge of framing your experience, that you're describing your experience to yourself all the time and assuming that your opinion is correct. Yeah, assuming your opinion was correct. I used to have an opinion that Santa Claus was real, <coughs> right? When I was a little girl, I really thought he was real. He wasn't, but it felt true. It was an opinion, it was a thought. We have plenty of thoughts that have come and go over the years, plenty of belief systems that have been turned on their heads, but in the moment of feeling an opinion, it seems certain to be true. And so training yourself to land on an opinion, not like have no opinions, because then you become one of those very obnoxious people who is frustrating to communicate with, right? You're like, what do you think? And they're like, oh no, just whatever, right? And you wanna shake them, right? Um, but to have opinions, but to land on them lightly, Right? Subject to more information, I believe this. Subject to more logic and input, so far I believe this. But I'm landing lightly with the assumption that I don't have the whole picture because so far I haven't had the whole picture. So this landing lightly, yeah? You know that if someone cut you off in traffic in a really horrible way, but beforehand you knew that they were racing to the hospital, it wouldn't make you mad, right? We have, we, you know, assume all these things about people and then get mad because of it. And if you knew someone's story completely, it's almost impossible to not have compassion. Yeah, it's because we don't know the whole story that we're angry and because we assume it has something to do with us. Yeah, we just got in front of their affliction, so we copped it, you know? So. It's really interesting to play with patience a little bit because you realize that then the most difficult situations in your life have been the ones that have forced you to look at things. Yeah, and it seems so cliche and trite to say that your greatest enemies are your greatest teachers. That seems like just a hokey Americanism, right? And yet it is true, right? It's cliche for a reason. <laughs> it's because, it, you know, coming up again and again, it is actually true that your greatest enemies are your best teachers, but only if you decide for them to be your teachers. Yeah, only if you decide to. And the other side of patience is looking at just suffering in general. So physical suffering or mental suffering and realizing that there is a difference between having an experience of suffering and deciding that equals a certain mood. Yeah, that if I feel like this, then I have to be like that. Those associations that we assume are true aren't. And so patience is really understanding that you have more mental power than you realize and that you could have something like, say something quite extreme like a bit of a depression and it actually not mean that's who you are. That this is weather passing through that I can navigate within. It's not the entirety of my being. Yeah, it's the response to a collective group of conditions. Yeah, which I am responsible for, I'm in charge of, but are not my fault. Yeah, it's a different way of looking at suffering. And then you're even, if you're putting it in this great worldview of may I transform my mind so I can be of greatest benefit to both myself and others, then you're looking at suffering so differently because whenever bad things happen, physically or mentally, you think, ah, this is one more gateway to empathy. This is one more way for me to connect to other people and understand them more deeply. Because without this particular suffering, I would be a little bit in the dark about what it's like for people when they experience this. So my compassion might not be quite as strong because I wouldn't really get what's going on for them. 
Yeah. Do you know this feeling how you can be a lot more patient with people who have a suffering you relate to than you are with people whose suffering you don't relate to? Yeah. It can go the other way, right? If it's a suffering that's similar to your own, you can become very judgmental. If they're not coping as well as you cope, right? You can become quite judgmental. So know that that can happen and decide not to let it, <laughs> right? But when you're having a suffering, I think it is a really fascinating thing. Like sometimes we do retreats where we're not drinking or eating. And if you're not used to it, you can get so grumpy, right? Just no food and water for a day, right? Like we're not wasting away, right? We're gonna be fine, right? But just one day, no food and drink, you can start to get so impatient, so grumpy. And then suddenly it occurs to you, oh, maybe that's why there's always war in Africa. They're hungry, right? Oh, maybe that's why there's not so much peace in the Middle East, it's too hot. They don't have enough to drink sometimes. You know, of course there's way more complicated issues at play than that, of course, but it gives you a little pathway of understanding about why maybe someone reacted so quickly or in a way you didn't quite get. Because now you have that suffering, you kind of go, oh right, I'm not as in, I'm not in as much control as I usually am when my blood sugar is just a little bit lower. Not even dramatically, just a little lower, I have a little less control. Next time I see someone behaving in this way, I will have this, oh, I know that place. Rather than, what is wrong with you? Get it together. Yeah, and if you have that, oh, I know that place, that feeling, that compassionate feeling is very steady and reasonable and kind. You're okay seeing someone else's bad behavior. It's not getting to you, right? Whereas when you're going, oh, what is wrong with you? You are also quite agitated. Their agitation is triggering your agitation. Yeah, so patience is, is a huge piece. And, you know, it's one of those ones we keep coming back to the same general idea, but go deeper and deeper with it each time. The one that we're going to focus the retreat on is joyous effort. And joyous effort is probably the least talked about, strangely enough. Um, in Buddhist talks, you'll get teachings on these other five probably quite often. Um, I think even Geshe Sherab is gonna teach on all six when he comes, um, but so it's a quite common teaching, the teaching on the six perfections. But joyous effort is actually a very technical set of strategies to prevent burnout and to recover from burnout. It's ancient wisdom, completely relevant now. And it, I was so intrigued when I first came across these teachings because it really feels like it's speaking to our current age, even though it was written thousands of years ago. So joyous effort, in a nutshell, is just liking what you're doing <laughs> when what you're doing is of benefit. It's, quote, delight in virtue, right? But what it really means is that beautiful momentum that you feel when you're in the zone yeah, when you are, you are putting in effort, but you're loving it. Do you know this feeling? Like kids have it when they're playing, right? They play tag or something and they're just running around and running around, so much effort, right? But they're happy as can be, yeah? So it's not a joy without effort. There's a joy with the effort that we're trying to figure out how to bring into every piece of our life. So it's not the absence of effort makes you relaxed, happy, joyful, recovered. It's not the absence of effort. It's a different way of approaching effort. Does it make sense? So, so joyous effort kind of boils down to finding your motivation in life. You don't have to keep the same one the whole time. You can play around with different motivations for your life. But one way to look at this is to ask yourself, in my past, when was I happy and why? In my past, when was I happy and why? And not just the surface details of the event or job or set of people, but what was going on with my thinking. When I was happy, why? And if you peel back the layers and peel back the layers, usually the things that make us happy involve connection. Yeah? Connection with other people, connection with ourself. They involve purpose and meaning. Do you think? Yeah, the things that really give us joy. Yeah, like, you know, why is it fun to go out to a comedy show? 
you know, you were, we're all kind of laughing at ourselves together. There's connection, yeah? Why do we like to do volunteer work for a, a cause we believe in? Because we, there's a greater purpose, there's a meaning there, yeah? So, you know, just kind of unpacking, like, what makes me happy and why? And, you know, it's, it's tricky because normally we go for the crumbs of happiness, the, the type of happiness that is accessible and quick. Like, you know that the favorite armchair and the favorite novel is going to do something in terms of stress relief. So in terms of asking yourself the big questions, you're like, all I've got in me is to just crash. Yeah, which is normal, but isn't necessarily the strategy that's going to lift your life to something a bit more joyful consistently. Yeah? So what are you thinking about this piece, this first piece of finding your motivation to give you some momentum and continuity? I'm thinking it's bang on. <laughs> yeah, right. I know what you mean. <laughs> it's bang it's on. So right. And so, I don't know, if you're someone who's not super Buddhist, but still connected to like altruism, what would you say to yourself about what your motivation for life is, or the purpose of your life is, or the point of life? What's, what's a big picture framing that would work for you? Just in your own words, what do you think? Could even be one word, a word that you're about. Yeah, just sit with it for a sec. I mean, I do this with really tiny kids sometimes, where um, I say, okay, guys, we're going to find out the purpose of your life. All right, here's a list of words. Just pick one. <laughs> and then you're going to write it on a cushion and put it on your bed. And every morning you're going to look at it and go, yay, and cuddle it and say, may I have it inside and give it out. Yeah, it's not rocket science, but there is huge huge benefit in identifying it and repeating it. So, you know, the words I give the little ones are like peace, <laughs> right? Compassion, love, right? Happiness. So if they've written the word peace on their little cushion, then they wake up in the morning, they see their little cushion, and they give it a cuddle and say, may there be peace inside and peace outside. Done, right? Done, right? But there is a, such a difference in your day if you've thought about the point first. Because our lives just whoosh by, don't they? Every year it feels like it's going faster and faster and faster and faster. And is it building a momentum and a continuity towards a beautiful end and a, and a deathbed moment of great satisfaction of that was a life well lived? Yeah. Or is it the sort of time, well, wow, I just, I don't know what happened in the 90s, yikes. But anyway, there were some good bits, <laughs> right? You know, there, there's some, like, probably some years where not a lot was of benefit, <laughs> right? Yeah, you probably had your moments. But are you feeling really satisfied with how you lived your life so far? Really honestly, like, do you get to your deathbed and think, I wish I had held more grudges. Yeah, I really wish that I'd been angry more often. Yeah, and really just developed my impatience. I wish I'd done more of that. Those are not deathbed thoughts, right? I wish I'd just really spent a lot more time on Netflix. Just a lot more time on Netflix, right? <laughs> deathbed, right? right? You know, I mean, ask yourself what your regrets will be, you know, it's, it's a good idea, right? To just check in, like, when you look back over your life, what you'll be proud of is probably the relationships you maintained and built and brought l mutual love and affection and insight to. Yeah, do you think? Right, and you know, if you are happy about your work, it might not be the work itself, but the relationships at the work, or what you did together as a group that was of some benefit to the world, right? Or relieved some suffering in the world. How you were in your family, you know? You know, will you kind of wait till the bitter end and say, I'm so happy I held that grudge against my sister this whole time and never forgave her and never made up. I'm so happy that I did that, yeah! 
I hope she feels terrible and die, right? Right? But it's like, it's not going to just get better by kind of going, oh, that's uncomfortable anyway, you know? It, it's, it's an interesting thing. So it's not like you have to immediately become a saint or anything, but it's kind of having this idea of, all right, so if this was my last week on earth, what would reprioritize? What would I decide to give more time to? And what would I just naturally not give time to? Yeah, because there's a lot of things that just would not bother us if it was the last week, right? If there was just some weird pettiness at work, if there was some annoying construction happening on your street, right? If there was some part of your body you were not a fan of, you thought, oh, I could really lose some weight. You know, if there was some weird mole growing out of your head and you keep thinking to get it lasered off, I don't know. If there's weird stuff happening in your life that, you, that right now annoys you, if you're going to die in a week, you just stop caring. You don't have to make an effort to stop care. You just naturally reprioritize, don't you? Right? It's interesting. And so it frees up all this space of, oh, right, okay, that one friend, I need to tell that one friend how much they helped during the divorce and just how much I appreciate how much time and energy they gave me when I was really struggling. I have to tell them. I don't know if they know. Yeah? That one person who really helped me when I was struggling financially and gave me a loan, I have to tell them how much I really benefited from that and how grateful I am that they trusted me. That boss that gave me a chance. Whatever, you know. What do I want to do with my time? Maybe I want to be in nature and really just enjoy the interconnectedness of biology. Maybe I just want to share some time with my loved ones. You know, but things would be different if your awareness of death was very present. Yeah, and a lot less energy would be wasted. Yeah, and so I think it's important to understand that a lot of what we do to soothe ourselves and to relax and to recover actually does not soothe, relax, or help us recover. It gives us a little crumb of pleasure, which we call relaxation and recovery. Okay, so what we want to start looking for is strategies that actually help you revive. Okay, because part of joyous effort is learning how and when to rest. Built right in joyous effort is rest, but it's of a very specific type that's effective, effective resting. Yeah, and you know, the piece of that, that to take home with you tonight is rest before you're exhausted, not because you're exhausted. Yeah, if you rest before you're exhausted, you will have energy to continue. Yeah, um, it's a little bit like I was reading this thing online about walking. And if you walk a little bit faster, you have better momentum and it's actually easier on you. And if you walk really, really slow, it actually takes more effort. Yeah, and I was thinking about that because I'm a slow walker and I get tired walking. And then I thought, all right, what if I just pep it up a little bit? Let's see. And I noticed that it did it, like it created its own momentum. But if I pushed it too far, of course, I'd be speed walking and get myself really tired. So just like walking, we're trying to find the pace that is kind of self-perpetuating. Yeah, the sort of pace that you don't need to recover from, that's a sustainable pace. That's not sprint and collapse, sprint and collapse, which is what we're kind of trained to do. Yeah, and to feel like actually it's far more efficient and far more joyful if I rest before I'm exhausted because then maybe I'll enjoy my life, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. So then the second piece here is overcoming obstacles. So overcoming obstacles in the joyous effort section is okay, first you've set your motivation or figured out your motivation, generally speaking, but then you have to ask yourself, what blocks that? What are the things that make me forget my motivation? Yeah, what are the things that kind of like interrupt my momentum or my continuity? And so really we want to just identify them, figure out what they are, because then we can catch them when they arise. And again, a lot of these can be the very things we look to to soothe us and revive us. Like, for example, entertainment, okay? So entertainment isn't bad or good in and of itself, right? It's not good or bad in and of itself. But the thing about entertainment is that if we label it as relaxation, that's actually a mistake. A lot of our entertainment stimulates us. 
Yeah, even television, right? You think you're relaxing because you're laid out on the couch, but actually there's a lot of images and ideas and conversations. There's actually a lot to process when you watch TV. You know, whether it's good, good TV or bad TV, you know, when no one is judging your Netflix choices, but the, the actual act of watching TV, that entertainment itself is not actually re reviving you. It's entertaining you. Okay, and so that means it's one more thing to process at the end of the day. So even if you're good at watching TV and going straight to bed and falling asleep, that first bit of your sleep is going to be working out the images and things that you've just seen. And it might even be that your whole night is processing what you've seen and you wake up thinking about that show. Yeah? And you didn't even get to processing the day before you watched the show. Yeah? So, you know, sleep is really about helping you recover from the day and process the day and integrate the day. And so the more mindful you are during the day, the less you have to recover from. This is a really interesting thing to play with is that actually focus as opposed to stimulation, focus actually helps you not have to recover so much. So if you can be just very awake to what is happening while it's happening, to trying to train yourself out of disassociating. During the day, there's a lot of points where because we don't always love what we're doing, we're looking for an escape hatch. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's, a, there's something going on in the day that's boring, that's frustrating, that you want to just get through, and so you're half focused and half like off with the fairies. Yeah? Or half kind of like, I don't know, in a daydream or you're listening to music or something like that. And it's understandable and, you know, keep doing it if you need to. But if you can just gently check in with maybe instead of doing that, what if I meditate for five minutes, three minutes, just on the breath, kind of recalibrate and refocus. Just little mini sessions peppered through the day. If you can't even do that, you're injecting mindful moments to kind of come back to being present. Like, uh, for example, I take my shoes on and put my shoes off. No, other way around. Take my shoes off, put my shoes on, often throughout the day, okay, because of my line of work. Okay, there's a lot of shoes on, shoes off. So every time shoes on, shoes off happens, I come back to my motivation. Because it's something I have to do anyway. Yeah? So I'm tying it with something I'm doing anyway, and it's just like a three second recalibration of if I've stopped being present, I come back to being present. Um, if I'm wearing my glasses, every time I push my glasses up my nose, I try and remember my motivation. When you go to the bathroom, you have to go to the bathroom anyway. Right. You can think all of the tension that came before this moment in the bathroom is going down the drain. <laughs> right? Which is ridiculous. You should not say these things out loud, okay, especially in a public bathroom. But it's interesting, like if it's what you're doing anyway, how can you tie moments of mindfulness to that? Because you'll find that at the end of the day you have less to recover from. Yeah, and I mean, think about days that you've enjoyed, the way they just whoosh by, and the days that you've really enjoyed, probably you didn't have tons and tons of verbal thoughts in your head. There was, of course, thought, but there wasn't that kind of busy, oh, how can I get out of this? What should I do? How can I, how can I, what can I, what can I? There wasn't a lot of that chatty chatty on days that you really, really enjoy. You were just in it, awake and in it, yeah? especially doing something fun with your friends or doing something connected in nature or doing a project that you really love, you're in the zone. You're not describing, right? You're not saying, here's what's happening right now and why I hate it, <laughs> right? Which means you're not actually there on the spot in it, yeah? So a lot of our teachers um, sleep very little or uh, not at all because they don't have anything to recover from. Yeah, they don't have anything to recover from. But for us at our level, what we're trying to do is have less to recover from by really naming our entertainment as entertainment. Yeah, so it's like, if I wanna have a little entertainment break, I'm gonna call it what it is. And I'm gonna do it at a time where I'm gonna be able to process it before the actual recovery time of sleep, yeah? 
Um, you know, I mean, a lot of us read before we go to bed. At least read something that's not going to make you anxious, angry, you know, etc. really emotional, right? If you have to keep your reading before bed habit, just be careful that you're not using it as a way to wear yourself out unintentionally. Yeah, just, you know, just checking. Just checking, because some things do it more than others, and everybody's really different and really individual. But, you know, I think just taking a step back from the things we call relaxation and realizing a lot of them are stimulation that we then have to process can help you change the way you look at it. So, you know, the way we do with our phones is that probably when you first pick up your phone, there's a reason. Well, not always nowadays, right? But sometimes there's like you go to your phone to check something, right? You're going to check a message or you're going to read the paper or something on your phone. But then once you're there, uh-oh, right? Once you have got the phone in hand, hours can be lost, yes? Of all of the possibilities of the things you could find on the internet, you know? So you could go from like interesting commentary about this situation in Syria, very interesting, then, oh, cat video, yep, excellent cat video, very good there. Oh, what's my friend doing over there? Oh, look at them, they're in Spain. Oh, those are beautiful holiday snaps. Oh, what's over there? You know, your whole life goes by. Right? And so if, if we're realizing that it seems like soothing because it's entertaining, yeah, and because we're a little bit stimulated, we're getting some nice chemicals happening in our brain with the stimuli, but to know that that is actually not relaxation. Name it what it is, you know, and give yourself a limit. Give yourself a limit. And there are even apps to give you a limit <laughs> because it's such a pervasive problem. But this is the problem for us is that once we find something that kind of gives us crumbs of happiness, we forget about the cake of happiness. And we just settle for crumbs because it's all we know. It's normal, right? It's, quote, natural that if we find something that gives us a little bit of happiness, we just keep going for it until it exhausts its ability. But actually to consciously take a step back and say, no, I'm going to go for the cake of happiness. So the thing I want to really convey to you is that at first, when you change a habit, it will be uncomfortable. It will be boring, but not for long. For a surprisingly short amount of time, it will be uncomfortable. But we're so used to soothing ourselves when it's uncomfortable that we're like, oh, it's not working. Oh. Check it out. It's the first maybe minute of a meditation that our mind goes, I'm not stimulated enough, like an angry child, right? It's like, Dah, what do you mean just the breath? Piss the breath. Blah. I don't want the breath. Yeah, I'm going to come up with a cool thought. Yeah, I'll show you breath. <laughs> right? But we do. We have like a tantrum. We have a little tantrum in our mind when we sit still. If you can reassure yourself that tantrum actually wears itself out and it's really normal. Yeah, you sit down to meditate and you're like, I don't want to. You're like, I know you don't want to. Just go for it. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? It's the first minute. Sometimes it's the first five minutes if you've had a rough day, right? Sometimes if you're used to being agitated, even though you don't want to be agitated, you don't know what to do with yourself if you're not. Yeah, you're so used to being hyper-stimulated that there's a little bit of a freak out when some space comes. So it takes some bravery to just see what happens if you hold your seat. Just see what happens if you hold your seat. Just see what happens if you choose to come back to the present each breath. It's an active choice, not a passive choice. Yeah, and that each moment there's a decision to be made fall asleep or wake up. And if you make the wrong choice one breath, you can make the right choice the next breath, so it's no big deal. Do you understand? And, and so to just kind of inject these moments in the day where you let yourself have your little tantrum, your minor meltdown of, I'm not stimulated enough, so I'm going to go to sleep, or I'm not stimulated enough, so I'm going to go into a song on the radio, or I'm going to go into a cool thing I saw, or I'm going to go into an old memory. And just go, no, you're not. You're going to watch the breath. And your mind goes, but I don't want to. And you say, I know, but you're going to watch the breath. 
<laughs> right? And it'll say, but I'm too tired. And you'll say, no, you're not. Come back to the breath. <laughs> because if you really are too tired, have a nap first. Yeah, have a nap. If you're that tired that you are actually falling asleep during your meditation, then go to sleep. Don't meditate. Yeah, but if you're not so tired that you're actually falling asleep in your meditation, you say to yourself, you're not tired. You're trying to distract me. I know your ways. Nope. Yeah, or you're trying to entertain me by remembering that one time that was so cool. And you cycle through the greatest hits of your favorite memories. Yeah. So, uh, again, just to remember that that discomfort does not last forever and out the other end is so worth it and means the rest of the day has a chance. Yeah, it means you might actually recover when you sleep. You might actually wake up fresh and wanting to do your life. Yeah, like this. So uh, overcoming the obstacles means you have to identify the obstacles and pretty much they all boil down to attachment and aversion, most of your obstacles. But the way they look is different forms of what we call laziness, which is so triggering because none of us want to be lazy or be considered lazy or think that we're lazy because we're so busy. That's proof that we're not lazy because we're so busy. But one of the forms of laziness described in the Buddhist literature is the laziness of busyness. Yeah, because you've made yourself busy with certain things in order to avoid the bigger things. Yeah? And I mean, there's tons of forms of this, but it's, it's the classic tale of if you've got a big project to do and then are about to start and then suddenly like have to empty the dishwasher. <laughs> right? Right then. <laughs> right? The dishwasher's been sitting there all day happily, but right then you have to empty it. Yeah? You're just about to do a big thing and you like psych yourself up and like do the laundry. That I can do, the laundry I can do. And it's tricky because you let yourself off the hook thinking, but I do need to do the laundry. I do need to empty the dishwasher. These are things that must be done, right? Not realizing that your reason was avoidance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it does, you laugh at yourself. That is the best response. You go, there I go again. Yeah, there I go again. And maybe I'll even keep doing it, but at least I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And let me give myself a little limit again. And to remember also with all big projects, sometimes especially projects that we love, that there will be that same friction as in meditation, where when you first start, you will rebel. When you first get yourself to the chair, you'll be like, I don't want to, ah, I need a cup of tea. And then you'll sit down and go, oh, this chair's not good enough. And then you'll sit down and go, okay, something. I'm going to change the background on my desktop. Hmm. Right? right? This is what happens to us. So even if it's something you even want to do, this can happen because of attachment. Okay? Because we're attached to the way we want it to be in its finished form. And part of us is scared we can't do that and would rather not have that proven than to do it well and find out we're less than we thought. Better not to have that proven. <laughs> yeah, it's because of attachment. Or it's attachment to doing frivolous things instead of the big thing. Yeah, but I mean, how satisfied do you feel when you actually do the big thing that you've been meaning to do? And you actually do it. And maybe not, it's not as perfect as you wanted it to be, but it's done and you did it. It's a really, it's a happy feeling. Yeah, but again, there will be that same rebellion, resistance thing that happens when you sit down to do a project that you want to do, especially a project you don't want to do. But to remember that it's just those first few minutes where it's awful. Hold your seat. Be brave. And remember all the times that when you kind of moved past that hump of resistance, there was a flow afterwards and you just got on with it and maybe even enjoyed it. Does that make sense? Yeah, <clears throat> and we forget that procrastinating, do you guys know this word, procrastinate, to put off, to put something off. Say, I will do it tomorrow, I will do it tomorrow. That procrastinating, that actually really takes up a lot of mental energy. The energy of not doing takes as much or if not more energy than actually doing it. 
Yeah. yeah. Even it can come into your spiritual practice, right? I'm going to meditate. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll, I'll, tomorrow morning. Morning's a better time. I'll do it in the morning. I'm going to set my alarm. Yep. And then you're like, oh, no, it's a bit not, not this morning. But I'm going to do it when I get home from work, right? It's, it, we do this, don't we? But actually, we've now worn ourselves out. Right? And we haven't even meditated. And we think, oh, it's so tiring to meditate. We haven't even done it yet. <laughs> yeah. So to remember that procrastination is mental energy. Putting off something takes effort. Yeah? That actually, if you just get on with it, you'll free it up. But again, part of why we put it off is we're a little bit scared of what will happen when we actually start. Yeah? Maybe we've burned ourselves out in the past and it's a little bit of fear. Maybe we have an unrealistic expectation of ourself or what is possible and we don't want that proven. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why we put stuff off. But to know that the putting off hurts you. Yeah, it wears you out. And so watch yourself as you procrastinate, wearing yourself out with why you're not going to do it now, all those reasons why. All that mental energy with all of those reasons could have gone into the project itself and it would be done. Yeah. Or it could be that in, if you feel like, okay, how about instead of putting it off energy, I say to myself, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Instead of I'm not going to do it yet, just, it's an interesting thing to do with your mind. What if you say to yourself, I'm not going to meditate. I'm not going to. Mm -mm. Yeah, not tomorrow morning, not at all. Sorry, mm -mm, not going to do it. Sometimes part of you will go, but I want to. <laughs> right? But I wanted to. Don't take it. <laughs> it's interesting, right? So, you know, you're just kind of experimenting with what are you saying to yourself in there? What the heck's going on? Yeah? What are you saying to yourself? And so, if you're procrastinating again and again, come. what if you just push stop and say, okay, today I'm not doing it. Let's look at why I need to, why I've decided I need to, what are the hang-ups around it, how about the project isn't doing it, or not doing it. It's asking myself more questions about it, whatever it, it is. Yeah? Then at least it's, it's productive waiting. Because procrastination is unproductive waiting. Yeah, it's harmful waiting. Yeah, so if you need to wait, wait. But ask yourself more questions that are useful. So you have the super busy version, and you have the putting off version. And then the other obstacle is what we call the laziness of self-contempt. Or the laziness of despondency. Or looking down on yourself. Thinking that this thing I want to do, this, this thing I seek, is only for special people, not for me. This is for special people, so I won't be able to do it. <laughs> it feels like depression or paralysis. It feels like being stuck, that one, where it's just like, oh, I probably can't do this. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough, that one. That one that stops us from trying. And it seems a little harsh to call that laziness, but know that this is, this is a whole different worldview we're coming from in Buddhism, which is any of your mental activities are not necessarily you, right? You can say, that is a silly way to think, that is a negative way to be, but you are not negative. You are not bad. Yeah, these are habits. So have some space from them. Don't feel like you're being told off or being told you're a bad person. No. We're talking about traits in an objective way that all of us have sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, fight with the trait. Don't fight with the person. Yeah. So you're saying, okay, so the idea that I am not good enough is actually sometimes a distorted pride. Like if I can't just do it magically without effort, it's not worth doing and I can't ever do it. Sometimes we have this. If I can't just magically know how to do it, that must mean I'm deficient and bad. But the assumption that you could magically just do it is huge pride, right? And especially this is common amongst very smart people who have had things come easily, right? When you've been able to learn things easily in a lot of different contexts, then when something doesn't come easily, you feel like there's something wrong with you because you never learned how to learn, because you didn't really ever have to until this moment. 
And so you can have this real sadness eat at you, like, what is wrong with me? I don't, I can't do this. Realizing that you didn't go through the steps of learning how. This sometimes happens, yes? Can I ask, is that then uh, the f fear of failure? Would that be this objection or obstacle? I mean, fear of failing, sort of. Sometimes I feel mm. fear of failing the meditation when I'm just supposed to listen to my, or pay attention to my breath. Mm. That's more scary to me than doing some analytical meditation. Yeah, right. So sometimes it is, yeah, sometimes right. it is. Yep, this kind of distorted pride, which feels like depression. Um, it's, it's another symptom of like perfectionist thinking, right? When you're holding yourself up to, this is who I am, this person up here who can do these things, this is who I am, but how you actually perform is here. Then the friction between how you see yourself and how you are makes you go, oh, something's wrong with me, and then sink into self-loathing. Pride is a weird little sucker because it seems like you think you're so wonderful, but then you wind up thinking you're crap, and you never actually see yourself as you are, and as you are is totally fine, right? But that's what pride does. So it takes, here's your set of qualities and your set of abilities, and pride says, here's actually. And of course you don't perform that way consistently and then are disappointed and think you're nothing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like better not to try than be proven. <coughs> better not to try to meditate than have it proven that you can't meditate. Yeah. Um, it takes hu humility, yeah, it takes um, a little bit of um, settling down pride to say to yourself, I am a beginner, yeah, I am a beginner. It's an amazing quality to be able to say, I don't know, yeah, because again, our culture like looks down on people who don't, aren't experts, yeah, <coughs> it takes huge bravery to say, I'm a beginner. I don't know that, yeah. And um, this is new, so I won't be good at it. I won't be good at it, not because I'm bad. I won't be good at it because it's new. <laughs> That's all. If it weren't new, I'd be better at it. <laughs> because why do I do what I do well? Because I learned how and repeated it. It's not magic, <laughs> yeah. It's not magic. We would say uh, people that are, quote, naturally good at things practiced them before in previous lives. So like someone like Mozart, who was amazing, even as a little tiny kid, we would say he wasn't just magically that way. He, in previous lives, he had habituated his mind to music. So then it came naturally. Yeah? As if naturally. But whether you believe in this kind of idea or not, you do know what happens with learning. With learning, when there's repeated effort, it becomes effortless. Repeated effort leads to effortless. The same is true in meditation, the same is true in anything. Repeated effort leads to effortlessness. And the problem is, is that if many things only need a moment or two to be understood, you never develop that skill of how to learn. Yeah, And to take that step back to say, okay, what is step one? because I'm used to being able to do step one, two, three, and four all at once because I'm smart, yeah. Um, the spiritual path has nothing to do with intelligence, and that can be annoying if you're intelligent, <laughs> right? <laughs> really. But I mean, how many people have you met with uh, Down syndrome who are just way nicer than you? <laughs> yeah, like way nicer, <laughs> consistently, right? Um, yeah, genuinely. They're just genuinely happy to see you. They don't even know you. Hug, right? You're like, they're kicking our butt in terms of the friendliness. Yeah, really. So, you know, so to just think, okay, oh, it's not about intelligence. Oh, heavens. Then what do I do? <laughs> Start at the beginning, <laughs> right? Um, there's one of our nuns in the nuns community who does this so well. I, it's brilliant, and I just uh, think it's an amazing trait. If someone asks her a question that she doesn't know the answer to, she's like, why would I know that? I haven't studied it. <laughs> no shame, you know? Like, if we don't know something, if someone asks us a question and we don't know, we assume that means we're stupid, mm. rather than we just haven't learned it yet. That's all it means, is you haven't learned it yet. Why would you 
know something you haven't learned. That makes no sense. And yet if someone asks us something that we don't know the answer to, we feel stupid instead of, I need more education on it. Yeah. And so again, things that make us tired are feeling like you have to keep proving who you are, proving what you're capable of, but proving to who and why. Some of it might be professionally necessary, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it isn't. Um, who's watching? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time, there's a lot less scrutiny on us than we realize. We are not the center of the universe. And, you know, you can feel terrible and still feel like the center of the universe. Probably more feel the center of the universe when you feel terrible. This is happening to me. Yeah, why don't people understand me? Yeah, when you're really happy, there's not a lot of me in the words in your head. Yeah. So then the last piece of joyous effort is going to be connecting with contentment. So you start out kind of checking in with your motivation and figuring out those things that in the past have given you happiness. Here is where you're really going to the skill set of how do I link back into that ability? That happiness is a skill. Yeah, it's a tool, it's a skill, it's something you can develop and cultivate. It's not something you should just magically be, and if you aren't, you're deficient. It's, it's, a, it's a learned skill. And so being able to connect with contentment, um, this is where kind of the workshopping, and um, there'll be a bit more meditation in this section as well. So each of these three sections um, will do like maybe 20, 30 minutes of like the presentation of the philosophy. Then we'll talk about it a little bit in the group and then we'll do the meditation and just kind of like work through it in that way. So um, that's how the rest of the weekend will go um, is philosophical concept, questions and answers to clarify, meditate on it, and then ask some questions before we move on to the next bit. And um, your course materials that you'll be given or have been given, um, you can uh, read in between the sessions if you need some space. Um, you know, go walk around outside, go to the park out there. Um, or it could be the sort of thing that you don't have the mental space to look at during the retreat, but you look at when, you know, like a week from now to remember what's been said. So the course materials are for you to use as you see fit. Um, are there any questions? Or um, anything you really want to make sure gets covered? Any bits that you're really intrigued about that you want us to come back to during the retreat? Nope. Too tired. That's why you came. <laughs> okay. So um, we'll just do a little um, dedication. Uh, which is on, uh, it says dedication prayers. Does it say page four on everybody's? Maybe. Maybe it says page four. Dedication prayers. So just thinking any mental energy we put into these thoughts goes into developing our fullest potential so we can be of greatest benefit to all. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah. Did did any of you uh, meet Venerable Yuntum before? Were you here on how many were here for the other talks we had? So some of you have already met her. Um, 
she was um, ordained as a monk already when she was 21 years old. She is from Montana, and when she was 12 years old, she became a Buddhist in the middle of Montana where there were no Buddhists because she heard um, a song about His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It was a joke song where they're joking about he was, how he wasn't killing mosquitoes, and she thought that was the most wonderful thing she'd ever heard, a person who wouldn't even hurt a fly. So she got interested, and then uh, at the age of 21, she ordained. And then she did nine years of study of Buddhist psychology and philosophy in Australia and India and Taiwan, I believe. Um, and f since, um, after finishing her studies, she's been traveling around, teaching and offering service. Um, she offers, uh, offers service to a hospice, for example, uh, helping people that are uh, dying and she's a very um, highly appreciated teacher in Israel uh, at a center in New Zealand and she I don't think she's really based anywhere now she travels around and teaches and fortunately enough we were able to slot her in here we tried to get her back but then that was 2020 until we could uh, find another um, spot in her calendar so we we're very happy that she's here tonight uh, to talk about burnout um, prevention and recovery from a Buddhist perspective based on a text that is about a um, thousand years old, I think. So I guess people have been uh, struggling with these things for a long time.